The world around us and the culture around us we've been talking about is pretty bad. (laughs) And it's getting worse all the time. If you follow any kind of updates or news, you realize that crime is on the rise. Disrespect of others is commonplace. Sexual confusion and immoral behavior is everywhere. Fortunately, we have the church. We have each other, this little oasis in the midst of the cultural chaos. Amen? That was kind of weak, but I'll take it. But what happens when bad culture begins to creep into the church? What can we do when bad teachers and bad teaching threaten to turn a good church bad? And you ask, well, Ram, what do, you, what do you mean by that? What does that look like? Can you give us some examples? And yes, I can. And here's a few examples that I've come across here just recently. These are weekly, by the way. I'm only going to give you a couple, but you can find these on a weekly basis. This first one is an article, and it starts out like this. It says, a church in upstate New York marked LGBT Pride Month, which, by the way, was just this past month in June, by hosting a pair of drag queens at a worship service. The Park Church in Elmira hosted a, quote, worship is a drag event Sunday. The first Sunday of the month recognized by LGBT activists as Pride Month. The church affiliated with the United Church of Christ described the event as, quote, special communion worship service with guest presenters in drag. Led by the church's pastor, Reverend J. Gary Brin, the service was held to, quote, celebrate celebrate Pentecost, kick off LGBTQ plus Pride Month, and come to Christ's table of love, end of quote. The church published a flyer promoting the event on Facebook last month, which featured a man wearing women's clothing and makeup. In a message shared on his personal website Monday, Bryn wrote, quote, Just as there have always been queers, there has always been diversity in gender expression and affectional orientation, so there has always been diversity within Christianity. End of quote. The article goes on and eventually comes to this point where it says, meanwhile, the trend of churches embracing drag queens has become more prevalent across the U.S. A gay man who is also a drag queen was confirmed last year by a Methodist church in Illinois as a candidate for ordained ministry. He wore wigs and full makeup while participating in his church's Drag Sunday event. On May 12th, Trinity Lutheran Church in Greenville, South Carolina, hosted an event called Drag Me to Church, which also promoted the drag queen culture. This isn't the bar down the street, folks. This is churches promoting this nonsense. These are churches that are celebrating. I didn't even read to you like the the other three quarters of the article, which which interviews the pastor who goes into some of his theology, and it's just absolutely out there. This is church. You go, wow, that's just kind of a like a like outlier kind of thing. It's just like an oddity, isn't it? No, no. I mean, this, I, you read this stuff almost weekly. Let me give you another example. <clears throat> Once considered the denomination of scriptural truth bearers, Evangelical Christians might be in jeopardy of losing their theological reputation. In what researchers described as a shocking find, a new report from the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University indicated just over half of all U.S. pastors of evangelical churches have a biblical worldview. 51% of Evangelical pastors said, yes, I have a biblical worldview. You say, what does that mean? That means I view the world through a biblical lens, basically. 51% of evangelical pastors. That is dangerously close to the halfway mark. We're not, again, we're not talking about 
you know, a, a denominations that consider themselves kind of liberal and out there, these are supposed to be, evangelical means it comes from the word um, even, evangel, which means gospel. These are supposed to be gospel preaching, teaching, Bible believing churches. And you've got 51, only 51% of the pastor, a little over half, one percentage point over half saying, yeah, I view the world from a biblical standpoint. Folks, that is incredibly shocking and dangerous. This is a quote from the research director. The old labels attached to families of churches are not as useful as they were in the past said lead researcher George Barna, director of research for the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University. Quote, the best example is the term evangelical, which has traditionally connoted uh, churches where the Bible is revered and is taught as God's reliable and relevant word for our lives. With barely half of evangelical pastors possessing a biblical worldview and that number continuing to decline, attending what may be considered an evangelical church no longer ensures a pastoral staff that has a high view of the scriptures. That's where our churches are at, folks. And, and again, we, sometimes we get kind of... Um, uh, protected from some of this stuff because we're on Molokai and you can just kind of cruise along. But, but this is our world. This is where we're at. And so as we look at this, we go, man, what does all this mean? Well, it means for one thing that we need good leaders. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. But, but, but before we go on any further, I want to rehearse with you a little bit of where we're at in our current series, because we took a little break last week and we talked about some other things. And so let's kind of pull ourselves back in and get your mind back in gear for the book of Titus. Remember, the Apostle Paul, along with his ministry partner Titus, had traveled to the island of Crete, this, this big island off of uh, the Greek coast. The, Greece, the coast of Greece, and, and they went there specifically to help encourage the churches, help to build them up, and specifically to put leaders in place. And that didn't happen while Paul was there. He had to leave, and so he left uh, Titus behind. He said, Titus, you need to complete the work that we started and again, the primary responsibility that Titus was going to have was going to be to plug in good leaders in the church that would help them to know where they were going. And Paul knew that this task wasn't going to be easy because Crete was a notoriously bad place. It had a terrible reputation. It was known as a place of deceit. It was known as a place of sexual excess. It, the, 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 the people were, had a tendency to... Uh, want to party more than they wanted to work. It, the, the culture was just tough. And so when Paul left Titus behind, he knew that this was going to be a tough assignment. And so he writes Titus this short little letter of 46 verses as an encouragement and a reminder of what his mission is, what his goal is. And that's this book of Titus that we started to explore several weeks ago. In our last time together, we looked at verses 5 through 9 where he gave some specific qualification or characteristics of the type of leaders he was going to be looking for to plug into these churches. And the, the primary uh, characteristic that, the, that Titus was to look for is they were supposed to be blameless. That doesn't mean they didn't have sin, but they were supposed to live according to the gospel. Remember our first time together, we saw how Paul was putting a premium on the gospel. It was absolute priority in our lives. That it's the gospel that changes everything. And above everything, it changes the way we live if we really believe it. And so Paul was saying, hey, these leaders, they're going to demonstrate that the gospel is living in their life. And this is what it'll look like. But here's the problem. Sometimes we think that whatever happens in the church, the leaders will take care of it. I don't really have to worry about it. I don't have to be the expert on the Bible. I don't really have to know doctrine. Because, well, that's what we pay Randy for. He'll take care of all of that. 
And leaders are, according to scripture, they are supposed to filter the bad stuff that comes in. If, if the church is the body of Christ, and that's what scripture calls us, then, then the elders, the leaders of the church are kind of like the kidneys. They filter out all the toxins and the poisons so that the body functions healthy. The problem is sometimes we think that because that's the case and that's what leadership does, we don't have to do anything. But the reality is, folks, that we are all in this together and we all need to be aware of bad teaching, bad doctrine, bad ideas so that we can all be ready to deal with it as it comes. And so the, in, in the passage this morning that we're looking at, Paul points out some specifics about bad teachers and bad doctrine, and then he points out some specifics on how to correct these guys. And it's something that not just leaders need to be aware of, it's something that all of us need to be aware of. So let's jump right into it. The first is this, we're going to look at detecting bad teachers. How do you detect a bad teacher? Well, the first one is this. Bad teachers, and these are all pretty simple, by the way, but I think we miss them sometimes. Bad teachers, they have a bad message. Paul says this in verse 10, for there are many rebellious people. I think the eyes translation said insubordinate, and that actually is a very good translation of that word. They will not line up under authority is what it means. They, they, they are rebellious, they're insubordinate, and notice, Paul says that these, they're not just one or two of them. He says, there's many. We got a problem in these churches, Titus. There are many of these guys that will not line up under authority. And the authority he's talking about, because remember, there wasn't leaders in the church at this point. So the authority he's talking about right now is God's authority. They won't line up under the word. They're not being true to the gospel. That's what he's referring to here. He said, there are many of these individuals who engage in useless talk and deceive others. This is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. So this bad message they're teaching, there's two parts to it that Paul talks about here. First of all, it's an empty message. He says they engage in useless talk. The word literally means worthless or empty talk. There's, there's no... There's no spiritual, eternal value to the message that they're speaking. Folks, you can go to a lot of churches and you can sit in a lot of Bible studies and walk out and feel good about maybe what you talked about, but there's no spiritual, eternal significance to what was talked about. It's a lot of fluff. It's like so much cotton candy. It looks really good and it tastes nice, but it's not going to keep you alive. And bad teachers have a bad message that ends up many times being very shy on nutrition spiritually. Oh, a lot of times what happens is the, the, these people show up and maybe it's not in a Bible study and maybe it's not in a church setting, but it's one-on-one. And they'll start talking to you about some deeper spiritual truth that, man, if you get this right, you're going to be kind of in the in crowd spiritually. And I've heard so many different things over the years. And some of you have too. And some of you know what I'm talking about. When somebody comes along and it's like, hey, if you get this one right, you got it, man. Because, like, this is the thing to know. One of the big ones is, you know, discussing, like, does God pick people for salvation? Or is it their own free will? And they spend a lot of time debating on does God choose people? Or is it totally, and then they divide on that. And whole churches have split over this situation. You go, Randall, isn't that important? Yeah, absolutely. Do you have a view on it? I sure do. And I would love to share it with you, but I'm not going to argue with you about it because it's a secondary issue. It's not a main issue. The main issue is God loves us and he sent Jesus to die for us. And that is the only way we get our sin forgiven and get a relationship with the God of the universe. Wow, don't you think it's important to know whether God chooses us? No, because Jesus gave the command, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He didn't say go into all the world and find everybody you think is chosen. 
He said, just preach the God. You let me take care of the rest of it, right? I love what uh, the chancellor of the college that Louise and I went to and a number of you have gone to in here, Liberty University, he used to say this. I don't know about this predestination and free will thing. All I know is that the more people I share the gospel with, the more people seem to get picked. And I like that. Other people will come along and they'll say something like, well, you know, the, the, the thing that we really need to discuss is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Does, does he still give the gift of tongues? Does he still heal? Can we still prophesy? Again, folks, it, it's not that that's not important and it's not part of Scripture, but it's not the main thing. And some people have made that the main litmus test. If you don't have these certain gifts, then you're probably not a believer. You're probably not saved. And that is dangerous stuff. And we need to be careful what we make priority. Paul, over and over again, we're going to see in this letter to Titus, it's the gospel that's priority. It's Jesus that's priority and what he's done on the cross. Those other things are important, but they're not the main thing. He came to give us life and to give it more abundantly, is what he said. Some, some people argue about things like, oh, who do you think the author of Hebrews is? I've seen I, I, some of the circles I've been in, people argue about dumb things like that. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees would argue about dumb stuff like how many, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. If we're not careful, we find ourselves getting caught up into stuff that may be interesting, but isn't of eternal value. Paul says sometimes these guys are coming along and what they're teaching and what they're saying, it's useless, it's empty, there's nothing to it. It doesn't have substance that is going to save your soul or anybody else's soul. But then he goes on further and he says it's not only empty, um, an empty message, but Here's the second one. It's a deceptive message. For there are many rebellious people who engage in useless talk and deceive others. This is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. False teachers, bad teachers, have a deceptive message when it comes to the gospel. One of the most recent things that I read is that only 36% of people that call themselves born-again Christians believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Let me say that again. 36% of people who claim to be born-again Christians believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Folks, if Jesus is not the only way to heaven, just throw this whole thing away. Because... This book from from beginning all the way to the end is about Jesus and God's plan through him and about how he died for the world. And when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me. That was an exclusive statement. That's why we send out missionaries. That's why we have camps That's why we have Awanas. That's why we have youth programs. That's why we go out and we tell people that Jesus loves them because he is the way. He's God's plan. And we don't make up any other plans. He is it. It's through his death and resurrection that we get life, period. There is no other way. And any gospel that teaches anything else is a false Gospel, and gospel means good news, so it's not even good news, it's bad news. And and Paul says in verse 11, he says, they're turning whole families away from the truth by their false teaching. And, And remember, just as a reminder, when you see truth and faith in Titus, he's already established what that means. It's related to the gospel. It's not just truth in general. He's talking about the truth of the gospel. And these guys are teaching stuff about the gospel that is literally dragging whole households, whole families away. Why? Because more than likely... The head of the house, the man, was buying into whatever the false teaching was about the gospel and taking the rest of his family with them. 
And Paul says, this is dangerous stuff. This is not a message of life. It's a message of damnation. And this is vital that we understand that anybody that comes along and teaches anything else other than the gospel of Jesus and Jesus alone, it's bad teaching. And they're a false teacher. So, bad teachers have a bad message. Here's number two. Bad teachers have bad motives. At the end of verse 11, it says, and they do it only for money. Now, I don't know what your translation says, but that, that word money there actually is broader than that. It's a word that means advantage, benefit, or gain. They're doing it for some kind of advantage. They're doing it for some kind of benefit. They're doing it for some kind of gain. Paul says, look, don't be fooled by these guys. They're not in it for the right thing. They're in it for gain. It could have been monetary. It could have been position. It could have been just pats on the back. It could have been all kinds of crazy things. But Paul says they're not in it with the right motive. They weren't in it for the love of Christ and the encouragement and the building up of the church. They were in it for something else. And whenever you're in it for gain of any kind, you're going to go astray in your teaching. I had a guy come to me several years ago. And um, he, was, uh, he was wanting to, he actually called me, and he was wanting to come to Molokai to start a church. And... Um, as I was talking to him, I said, well, have you ever been to Molokai before? No, I've never been here. Well, I want to make a recommendation. Uh, before you come to start a church, I would recommend that you come and visit. Because Molokai is not like every other island in the chain. We are very unique, very special. And if you have a picture of Waikiki in your mind, you're going to be sorely disappointed when you come to Molokai. So my first encouragement is come visit first. We went on from there, and um, I didn't remember this until I talked to him later, several years later, and he told me this. But apparently in that conversation, I told him, hey, you, you need to understand that ministry on Molokai is not easy. It, it's difficult. Because there's just a lot of things we're up against. And I went through and I shared some of those things religiously. I said, there's a lot of false teaching here. There's a lot of false churches here. There's a lot of family uh, uh, history in those churches. And people don't even necessarily know what they believe, but they know their family is associated with that particular church. And so that's who they are. I said, that's tough. It's hard. So... I'm not telling you this to say not come. I'm telling you, you need to know what you need to be praying about and what you're up against before you come here. Here's what happens. A guy steps into a leadership and he steps into ministry and it's not because he's been called and it's not because uh, he feels a very strong compulsion to do that and he's setting himself up to get hooked by some kind of gain. Power uh, could be money, position. And if you're not careful, those things will grab you and take hold of you. So then what you start doing, if that's your God, and that's what happens, then you will start doing what is necessary to keep those things in place. And a lot of times what's necessary to keep those things in place, I won't teach certain things because I know they might ruffle feathers. I know that people might not like to hear it. Um, I'll teach other things that I know people will like to hear and it'll make them happy. And so I'll just kind of park there. And so what happens is they're dictated to, based on the desire of their heart, the gain that has hooked them, the advantage that they want, that is the thing that they will play to. And Paul says, look, these guys, their motive isn't right. Ultimately, he says, in so many words, they're basically just spiritualized versions of what's going on in the culture. 
That's what he says in verse 12. He says, even one of their own men, a prophet from Crete, has said about them, the people of Crete are all liars, cruel animals, and lazy gluttons. What was he doing? He, well, he's pointing out that the Cretan false teachers had crept into the church and they were really no better than the Cretans outside of the church. They were the same thing. They were just kind of a spiritualized version. These guys could be described the same way uh, as liars, cruel animals, lazy gluttons. In fact, when he says they need to be silenced, the word for silence there is the word muzzle. They need to be muzzled. So what Paul was saying is, look, the culture is bad outside, but you better be careful because that same nonsense is going to come through in a different form with these bad teachers. And folks, that, those are the kind of things I just read to you. That's exactly what, what I just read to you. Just because somebody's wearing a robe or has a title of pastor or, or reverend or doctor, that is not the reason that you listen to them. You listen to them based on how they're handling the word of God. Number three, bad teachers not only have a bad message, they have bad motives. Number three, they have bad manners. That's verse 15 and 16. It says, everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and their consciences are corrupted. Such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. There it is. He's connecting message with life. He's connecting gospel with life. These guys don't have a true gospel, and it's affecting the way they live. They are detestable and disobedient, worthless for every good work. In verse 15, he says they're corrupt. It's a very interesting word in the original. It means stained. They're stained, defiled, polluted. What's he saying? He's saying these, these people that are teaching these things and, and, and promoting these things, empty talk and deceiving and distorting the gospel, they're, they're turning good things into bad things. They're not pure people. And so everything they touch, they're defiling. They're stained. And everything they touch, they're staining. <laughs> I was thinking about this because when we broke camp on Friday, um, we went in to clean the youth room right over here. And the youth room during camp becomes our game room. So we have air hockey in there, and we have a little basketball shoot, and we have a little miniature pool table and several other games in there that the kids can play. And so <clears throat> we put the games all away and we went in there to clean. And there was red dirt smudge marks all over the walls. And there was, you could tell where the games were because on the floor there was red dirt, like thick, right where they played, you know? because they're going in there with barefooted and everything. And, and, and so <laughs> I'm looking at this going, why are, there, why are there handprints all over the wall? The games weren't on the wall. It, 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 they're just attracted to the wall. And it's, you know, and it's almost like, you can, hey, look what I can do. And so oh, well, I can do that too. But, but, but here's the reality of it was, they were all stained with this red dirt and everything they were touching was getting that stain. That's the picture here. These guys are stained. They are not pure. The implication is these are not even followers of Jesus Christ. They, they have come in and, and, and they have a false motive and they, they are teaching a false doctrine, a false message. Everything about them is stained and every life they're touching, they're staining. 
They can't even live the right way. Their manner of life demonstrated that they didn't even really know God. And it was like Paul was saying, Titus, make sure your people know to look at the way they live. Remember, he just got done in verses 5 through 9, giving this kind of characteristic, these qualities of what to look for in a leader. And basically he was saying, watch their lives and see if they're this kind of person. See if they're a person given to too much wine. See if they're a person that are raised raising their kids right, treating their wife right. They have a good reputation outside the church. Look for how they're living their life. Now he's saying, look at these bad teachers and see how they're living their life. And what you're going to discover is their manners, their manner of life is all messed up. They're staining everything they touch. You need to stay away from these guys. So how do we correct these bad teachers? I think it's basically two ideas. First of all, they need to be rebuked and refuted. In verse 11, he kind of, he begins to kind of give us an idea of that. And I mentioned this a minute ago. He says they need to be silenced. They need to literally have their mouth stopped. They need to be muted. In other words, the destructive message they're saying has got to be silenced. It is causing all kinds of problems. And so, Titus, as you put these leaders in place, this is their first assignment, to take care of these bad teachers and their bad doctrine, their bad teaching, because it's destroying everything. Then he says in verse 13, so reprimand them sternly to make them strong in the faith. Faith. The word reprimand there, and, and again, I believe that in Va'ai's reading, it was the word rebuke. That's a good word. It also means to shame, to prove one is wrong. The idea is not to just, Paul wasn't saying, just tell him, hey, these guys are wrong. Stop listening to them. That's not the implication here. The implication is tell them that they are wrong and then show them why they're wrong. In other words, take the scripture and say what they're teaching is wrong, and this is why it's wrong, and this is what the truth is. Because somebody might look at this and go, oh, well, is this kind of a Christian form of cancel culture? No, no, no. Cancel culture is when you don't like what somebody's saying, and you, you just totally X them out of everything. You don't even give them a hearing. This is not saying that at all. This is saying that something false is being taught. You are to step in and say, this is not true. Here is what the truth is. And in so doing, you shame them. In other words, they realize, oh, I've been caught. I've I've been shown that I'm wrong. That's the picture here. And, And notice what Paul says the goal is. To make them strong in the faith. Not just to beat them up. Not to make them look bad in front of everybody. Not to to say that I'm the guy that's got it all together and these guys don't. That wasn't the point at all. He says the goal is to get them in the faith. To help them to see that what they're teaching is bad. Not only for the people they're teaching, but it's bad for them. And to get them to a point where they understand, oh my goodness, I was wrong and this is the truth. Especially when it comes to the gospel. Because if these guys are going around teaching a false gospel, they don't even know the gospel themselves. They don't have Jesus. So Paul's saying, man, the goal here is to make these guys strong in the faith. Not just to cancel them out. But he says they, they need to be rebuked and refuted. The idea of refuted is to, to, to show them they're wrong. This is not truth. So what does that mean? That means if I'm going to do that, I better know what the truth is. So a lot of people go, I don't think that's right. No, you're wrong. But they never give them a reason why they're wrong. They never take them to the scripture and go, well, this is why that can't be. Um, Every once in a while, I'll have that happen where somebody comes up to me. I had this happen several years ago, right after a service, someone almost running up front wanted to point out to me the error of what I was speaking. And I said, well, uh, let's sit down and talk about this because I've done a whole lot of study on this and I'm, I think I'm right. Uh, I've had people email me. You know, I think you got this wrong. Da, da, da. Uh, okay, let's talk about it. Let's take a look at it. 
done a whole lot of study on it. I could be wrong. But why don't you show me where I'm wrong instead of just telling me that I'm wrong? Big difference, OK? Number two, they need to be inspected and rejected. Verse 16, such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. They are detestable, disobedient, worthless. Listen, for doing anything good. Remember what the theme of Titus is, living good in a world gone bad. These guys, you don't follow these guys to find out how to live good in a bad world because they don't have it together. They don't even know how to do that themselves. And what he's saying is stand back and check it out. Look, look at the way they're living their lives. Their lives are not showing that they even know God, let alone that they can speak for God. Folks, this happens so much. I can't tell you how many times I've read about different um, pastors, prominent pastors that have fallen into some kind of really bad sin. And then when the investigation comes out, you start looking at it. This wasn't something, it wasn't a one-timer. It wasn't something that, like they were walking along one day and they saw a beautiful woman and they got tempted and boom, they were there. This was something that had started years before. And because they weren't living according to the truth and, and, and following even some of the things they were saying, they began to stray years before and eventually fell into some kind of sin. That's how it works. It doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a straying away. Paul says, man, watch their lives. Look, don't get so enamored with what they're saying that you're not looking at the person themselves. Somebody goes, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. In order to do that, I've got to judge them. And we're not supposed to judge, are we? I mean, didn't Jesus say that? The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, didn't he say, don't judge? Because then you'll be judged. We love that. that. That's so huge right now. Especially in, in Christian circles. Yeah, no, I can't, I can't make a judgment on that because Jesus said don't judge. Let me tell you something. That whole passage is about how to judge. Read it. Read that whole chapter. It's about how to judge. Jesus said don't judge because in the same way you're going to be judged. Then he goes down and he says, how can you, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, this is a manly version, hasn't come out yet, but it will soon. How can you pull a speck out of your brother's eye when you got a log in your own eye? In other words, he's, he's saying, look, you're going around pointing out the faults, the little faults in everybody else, and you got this massive one of your own. He then goes down and he says, take care of the log in your own eye. Then you'll be able to see to help your brother with a speck in his eye. Later on in the same chapter, he's talking about false teachers, and he said, you will know them by their fruit. Well, how do I know what fruit is unless I make a judgment? The whole chapter is not about not judging. It's about judging rightly. And so, yes, I'm going to look at these guys and I'm going to make a judgment, but it's not based on my own understanding. It's based on the truth of God's word. That's what I'm going to make the judgment on. Look, this is what God's word says. This is what you're saying. What you're saying doesn't line up with this. I'm going to go with this every time. I had somebody come up to me years ago. Again, it was after a service. And um, they said, hey, God told me to tell you this. And that happens sometimes. And typically what I'll say is, unless it's, unless it's really crazy, and I know it absolutely defies God's word, I'll say, there's no way God could have told you that because it doesn't measure up with his word. But in this particular instance, it wasn't crazy. It, it very well could have been a word from the Lord. But when people tell me that, I say something like this. Thank you very much for sharing with, that with me. We'll see. If it's true, it's going to happen. If it's not, it's not going to happen. And I'll know they got it wrong because God never gets it wrong. See, if, if what they're saying doesn't line up with this and doesn't line up with reality, then I know they got it wrong because God never gets it wrong. And so Paul's saying here, look, you've got to inspect these guys. You've got to look at them. You've got to see where they're going. 
Then later on in the, in the letter, when we get into chapter 3, verse 10, he's talking about the same kind of people. Listen to what he says. If people are causing divisions among you, give a first and second warning. After that, have nothing to do with them. He says, look, these false teachers, these people that are causing divisions by what they're teaching and what they're saying is supposed to be true and it's not true, warn them, go to them, do this. Say, look, this is not right. This is what God's word says. This is what the truth is. You need to stop. He said, if they don't listen, go to them again. Look, we went through this before. Let me show you again. What is it that you're not getting? Let's talk this through. He said, after a second warning, if they won't listen to you, then stay away from them. Get away from them. Why? Because they're, they're bad teachers teaching bad doctrine that's going to lead to eventually bad things. And Paul's trying to encourage these people, look, there is a way that we can live good in a world gone bad, and these guys don't have that message. That message is anchored in a solid understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we understand the gospel, that changes literally everything. And I don't have to go off on side issues. I can come back to that every time because it's an understanding of the gospel and the love of God that's going to change my perspective on everything, absolutely everything. And don't let anybody fool you. Every issue that we face is a spiritual issue. There is no such thing as, well, this is, this is a kind of a secular issue and this is a spirit. There is no dichotomy like that, folks. There is, everything we face has some kind of root in a spiritual reality. That's why the gospel of Jesus Christ is so important for us to understand and hold to and preach because that's the news, the good news that's going to keep us good in a world that's gone bad. That's why it's so important that we protect the truth. That's why it's so important that we stand for what's good and righteous and right because it's only when we have the gospel right that we're going to know how to live good in a world gone bad. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for these things that were written so many years ago, and yet we still can glean so much from them today. It reminds us that these are not just the words of men, but you use men to write your word. They were your instruments, your tools to give us what we need today in a world that just seems to be falling apart all around us. Lord, help us not to despair. You, you've given us much hope in this. Help us to realize that you have the answer because you are the answer. Help us, Lord, in the midst of all this cultural chaos that we see happening to know that we can live good lives in a world that's gone bad. Help us to desire more than anything else to love you more and to love people more, God. Help our motive to be pure. Help us to desire to see the gospel advanced because it's the answer for broken lives and broken people. Help us to never compromise on this message of great hope that everyone needs to hear. God, help us to always be a place that puts you first and loves people genuinely no matter their background, no matter the sin that they've fallen into, no matter how they view us and think of us, we always demonstrate the love that can flow through us because of you, because of the great news that you came to bring hope to a broken world. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you in your name. Amen.